This is the MacBook Air M4 and this is the MacBook Pro M4 Pro and after months of testing both of these, there's very little that separates them. In fact, the biggest difference between these two machines is the price, where this MacBook Pro is nearly double the cost of the Air, but in real world use, they feel largely the same and it's only in certain instances where you see meaningful gains on the Pro. Today, I'm going to dive into an in-depth comparison between these two, going over what those instances are, what separates them, and what they have in common, and when it might make sense to choose one over the other. Let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Clean My Mac. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. Buying a Pro MacBook these days can be a difficult thing to justify, not just because the base level performance in the air has gotten so much better, but so has the price. Last year when the M3 Air came out, for a reasonable configuration that lines up with the M4 Air that I have here, you were looking at around $1500 USD, and the same config now is $300 less than that. So instead of a $500 price gap between the Air and the base MacBook Pro with a Pro chip, that's now a whopping $800. Even the base MacBook Pro with the same M4 chip and configuration as the M4 Air is 400 USD more, where performance will be relatively the same. And before we talk about the gains that you get with the M4 Pro, I want to talk about some of the more meaningful differences between these, starting with the design. Both of these are the smaller 13 and 14 inch models, where this particular Air is the new sky blue color and the Pro is space black. You do have four color options with the Air and only two on the Pro, which is all a matter of preference, but I will say that any dark MacBook shows fingerprints and dirt a lot easier than on lighter colors. Over time, you'll also see increased visible wear along the ports or the edges where there's a lot of contact on darker models, so if any of that is of concern to you, sticking with a lighter option is definitely your best bet. Outside of color, even though these take up roughly the same surface area, the air is noticeably lighter and smaller with it being 0.44 inches thick and weighing 2.7 pounds versus the Pro at 0.61 inches thick and 3.5 pounds. It might not seem like much, but it is quite noticeable, and the air is a lot nicer to pack around with you if you're mobile, although it does come at the expense of port selection, as it's limited to only two USB-C Thunderbolt 4 ports, and the MacBook Pro M4 Pro has three USB-C Thunderbolt 5 ports, an SD card reader, and an HDMI port, so the Pro is a lot more versatile in that sense. Now, if you drop the Pro model down to the non-Pro M4 chip, you do get the same amount of ports, but they go down to Thunderbolt 4 as well. And there are essentially two main differences to note between Thunderbolt 4 and 5. One is gonna be the overall speed. Thunderbolt 4 is capable of 40 gigabits per second, where Thunderbolt 5 goes all the way up to 80, so it is potentially twice as fast. That being said, both are very quick, and the only real places you'll likely notice a difference is with things like video editing. If you're editing super high bit rates or 8K resolution, transferring enormous file sizes, or things like machine learning workflows. You might notice that Apple says Thunderbolt 5 goes up to 120 gigabits per second, but that is somewhat misleading. That only references display support, where Thunderbolt 5 can potentially support high resolution monitors with higher frame rates, but in the case of the MacBook Pro, both the Thunderbolt 4 and 5 machines and the M4 Air have the exact same external display support, allowing you to connect two external displays up to 6K at 60 Hz, but the built-in display on the Pro and the Air is arguably the most noticeable difference between the two. Apple lists these screens as 13 and 14 inch models, but realistically the Air is 13.6 inches and the Pro is 14. 14.2, so they are very close in screen size, but the screen technology is vastly different, with the Pro having a mini LED 120Hz ProMotion XDR panel, while the Air has a 60Hz IPS Retina display. Side by side, it's pretty obvious that the Pro has a much better screen. 
Because it is a mini LED display, you get much deeper blacks and better contrast. And it supports HDR where the screen in the air does not. So HDR content will pop a lot more and go all the way up to 1600 nits peak brightness or 1000 nits outdoors in SDR. So it is a little more viewable in bright areas over the air screen that tops out at 500 nits. Having said that, when you're indoors, the brightness levels don't differ all that much from each other, and even though the IPS panel in the air doesn't produce quite as good of a picture and isn't as smooth with the movement having a lower refresh rate, it has the same great color accuracy and for an IPS panel looks great with no light bleed and solid black uniformity. In fact, with a lot of SDR content, which is what most people are going to be looking at the majority of the time, I don't think that there's a huge difference, especially if you're just looking at a lot of static content or browsing the web. And the only time that the Pro XDR really stands out to me is, again, playing that HDR content or when I introduce a lot of movement in apps like Blender or while gaming, but many of those things can be largely dependent on performance. When it comes to the MacBook Air, this machine has the M4 with a 10 core CPU, 10 core GPU with 16 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig SSD, while the MacBook Pro that I have has a 12 core CPU, 16 core GPU, 24 gigs of RAM, and also has a 512 gig SSD. Also, I get a lot of you guys asking me what app I'm using to show the stats and metrics in my videos, and for the most part, that has always been clean my Mac which I've been using on the channel for years. Clean My Mac shows me all these different metrics from their menu bar app related to performance, usage, and system health, but inside the app itself, there's a super clean UI with a host of features I use to optimize my Mac. I'll frequently pop in here and run the Smart Care module that streamlines all the key modules within the app into one easily viewable process. Within there, there's a cleanup module to get rid of junk or outdated caches and trash, a protection module that scans for threats and malware, performance which boosts system performance by flushing caches and running maintenance scripts, applications will check for updates, and my clutter frees up space by getting rid of unnecessary or duplicate files. Once you go through a scan, you get a detailed breakdown of each module where you have full control over what you want to do with each one, and you can always run specific functions individually from the sidebar if you want as well. Like I said, I use this pretty frequently, and especially when I make these videos, I always use Clean My Mac to make sure that everything is up to date and that I've run the maintenance scripts and flushed out any junk before I start running benchmarks, and having it running in the background uses virtually no system resources. And if you want to try out Clean My Mac yourself, you can get a free 7-day trial through the link below, so be sure to check that out if you're interested. Speaking of benchmarks, translating the specs into something tangible, in Cinebench you see roughly the same performance in single core tests, which makes sense given that the Air and Pro are based on the same architecture, but you see a 39% increase in performance in multi-core and 49% in GPU scores, so there is definitely a considerable gap when you start taxing each of these, but in real world use it doesn't quite convert the way that you might think. First of all, if you're sticking to less demanding things like productivity, web browsing, and to a large extent graphic design or photo editing, these feel largely the same where it's pretty tough to make out any meaningful difference between the two. The same goes for software development where, sure, if I run Xcode Benchmark, I can see about a 30% increase in compile times on the Pro, but neither really struggles in any software project that I've tried, and I'd say you'd need to be working in a pretty huge code base or something that utilizes a ton of resources to make the Pro stand out. With more resource intensive stuff like video editing, if you're making videos like these or working with simple or even somewhat complex timelines, again, in all likelihood, there are going to be very few instances where the Pro sees noticeable gains in any meaningful way. I've edited multiple videos on each of these and even with the Air having a bit less RAM, I still have absolutely no issues with it. 
The timeline scrolls and responds the same, and some plugins or effects might be a little bit snappier on the M4 Pro, but you'd have to have them side by side to really notice most of the time, and at least in Final Cut Pro, the M4 Air can tackle quite a lot. Now, if you were to have a bunch of things running at once, you do see the memory pressure and the swap file increase a lot larger on the Air over the Pro, but I've personally never had to worry about running out of system memory. I've had a couple of warnings in Clean My Mac on larger timelines in Final Cut Pro, but nothing that's ever affected my system performance at all, and these both have the exact same video encode and decoding engine, so render times are pretty similar, where you will see a slight improvement on the Pro, likely due to it having a more performant chip, and that it has active cooling versus passive cooling on the air. Having passive cooling means that the air does not have a fan and will get noticeably warmer to the touch under heavy loads and will throttle chip performance, but honestly, I really only notice it throttling in GPU heavy apps like Blender or in games. In Blender, the viewport is noticeably smoother on the Pro over the air, both because of the better GPU and the 120Hz display that I mentioned earlier. And having the better chip performance and more memory allows the Pro to handle more complex scenes much better than the Air, where there have been a couple instances where the Air has actually run out of memory, and I've had to restart it to navigate the scene again. Render times are also much faster, where the Pro is about 30 to 40% quicker and shaves minutes off complex renders. And the same goes for games where frame rates are noticeably higher on the Pro over the air, and this is where the Pro clearly jumps ahead. At times, you can see double the frame rates on the Pro, which is largely due to the better GPU. Games that usually struggle on Mac, like Rust, are a lot more playable on the Pro, and most of the other titles that I have, like Baldur's Gate 3, Civilization 7 and No Man's Sky do play fine on both, but there is definitely a noticeable separation between the two. That is one instance where SSD speed may play some part as well. Even though these machines have the exact same storage capacity at 512GB, the MacBook Pro sees about 40% faster read times, which in most cases doesn't really mean much. Even the older MacBook Airs that had half the speed of these current models didn't really have a perceivable impact in real world use outside of specific use cases like games or large data transfers and machine learning data sets. And the same goes for some of the other specs like memory bandwidth, where the M4 goes up to 120 gigabytes per second and the M4 Pro is at 273. I would say that going forward, memory bandwidth will be an important spec to pay attention to in respect to running local LLMs or running AI on device, but truthfully, outside of just running super small models, neither of these is really set up for that, and I would say that the determining factor as it relates to performance is predominantly going to be with GPU heavy workloads. Some of those more resource intensive tasks can have a big effect on battery life as well, and with the MacBook Pro being a bit thicker, you get a larger 72 watt hour battery versus 53 watt hours in the air, and there are some subtle differences there. Apple says that the M4 Pro MacBook Pro will give you 22 hours of video streaming, and the M4 Air will give you 18, and with casual usage like media consumption or productivity, the Pro definitely feels like it lasts a bit longer. And and the same goes for more resource heavy stuff where the air can really suck back the battery life if you're taxing the system. And the M4 Pro isn't quite as bad, but it is actually worse than last year's M3 Pro as it is using more performance cores in the M4 Pro. Still, with a mix of both lighter and heavier use cases, both of these give me over a day of use on a single charge, which is all I personally care about. And when it comes time to charge them, there is a slight difference where the the Air can fast charge up to 70 watts, where the Pro goes up to 96 watts, but because the Pro's capacity is a bit bigger, they charge at relatively the same rate and can give you a full charge in just under 3 hours or so. Other than that, there really isn't a ton of difference between the two. 
Apple upgraded the webcam in the M4 Air this year, which is about the same as the M4 Pro, and the internal mics are maybe a little bit better on the M4 Pro, but they have the exact same wireless and network specs, and the speakers are both fantastic, supporting Dolby Atmos and spatial audio, where the Pro is slightly better sounding and gets a touch louder, but both are still leaps and bounds better than almost every other laptop. For your regular everyday user, you're going to be able to do almost everything that you want on either of these. They're both built with great components and hardware, so you make no sacrifices there. And I do think that there is a ton of value with both of these MacBooks. For most folks, I think the M4 Air is probably the most logical choice, and you can do a lot with it, whether you're doing design work, coding, photo or light, video editing, and even some lighter 3D modeling. And I think it really only makes sense to jump up to the Pro if you want some of the other benefits, like the expanded port selection, the better screen, or if you're dealing with some of those heavier workloads, but it does come at a much larger cost. That being said, I would love to know what you think. If you had to buy a new Mac, or maybe a recently bought one, which machine are you picking and why? Let me know in the comments down below. Also, if you've got decision paralysis between these models, my advice would just be to go into the store and check them out and decide from there. And if you find that you made the wrong choice, you do have a 14 day return window if you've got buyer's remorse, but they are honestly both great machines. That's all I got for you today. I hope you found this video useful or enjoyable. If you did, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech-related content or help me design a keyboard that changes the backlight color depending on how dramatically you slam on the keys, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.